Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to episode, I think it's 114 of Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host, my name is Larry Erickson, and for the next eh, roughly half hour, I'm going to be ranting away at you with things important to me that I think deserve your attention. Uh, as always, any comments, questions, reactions, whatever to the show can be sent to me directly. My email address is whoviati, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. And if you didn't catch that, my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time. You can go there, comment there, get the email address from there, whatever. Uh, as always, if you do email me, please be a little patient. I do answer my email, but I can be slow about it. And um, be sure to include something like, you know, your cable show or something like that in the subject line so I know it's not spam. All right, with that, we're going to jump right into it. Had to do a very fast rewrite of the show this morning because, uh, well, to paraphrase Gabriel Heater, uh, there's good news this afternoon or this evening or whenever you're watching this. Turns out the Supreme Court watchers got it right. Uh, Wednesday morning, the Supreme Court announced it had struck down the Defense of Marriage Act, or DOMA. DOMA was the bill that denied federal marriage benefits to same-sex couples, even if those couples were legally married in their own states. Now, those couples have access to those same benefits. This decision does not expand the reach of same-sex marriage. It does not increase the number of people who can be married, but it is a very real step toward justice on the issue. Uh, just, uh, justice Anthony Kennedy, who wrote the decision for the majorities, wrote that the law, quote, violates basic due process and equal protection principles, and that no legitimate purpose could justify its effect which he said was, quoting, to disparage and to injure those whom the state, by its marriage laws, sought to protect in personhood and dignity. And what's more, as it turns out, the court watchers got it both, uh, right both ways. The court punted on California's Proposition 8. This was the state proposition that stripped away what had been an existing right to same-sex marriage there. The court said that the group filing the suit um, lacked the standing to bring it, so they just would, weren't going to consider it at all. The legal effect is to leave in place an appeals court decision which struck the provision down, which struck down Prop 8. Um, a decision, in fact, uh, the appeals court decision is one that the state of California had very pointedly refused to appeal. Now, the appeals court had stayed the effect of that ruling, uh, striking down Proposition 8, until the Supreme Court had ruled on the appeal. Well, now it has, and it's, it's expected that within the next couple of days, the uh, appeals court is going to lift that stay. And California Governor Jerry Brown has already told county clerks that they need to be ready to start issuing marriage licenses to same-sex couples. These two decisions, to put it simply, were as good as anybody could rationally have hoped for. Now, by the way, there's a footnote to this. Uh, Justice Antonin Scalia read part of his dissent from the bench, and he described the ruling as, quoting, a lecture on how superior the majority's moral judgment in favor of same-sex marriage is. To which my answer is, yeah. He also said, by the way, that the court should have deferred to Congress's wishes on the matter. Remember that it becomes important later. But of course, none of that, none of that means that the issue is over, uh, not by a long shot. Even, um, as, uh, uh, even before the decisions were announced, the bigots and bozos were going around pledging themselves to the preservation of their prejudice, even throwing around words like revolution and civil war, should the court act the way it did. In a letter released last Thursday, uh, more than 200 conservative activists vowed to ignore any ruling in favor of same-sex marriage, claiming marriage, which of course they say means one man and one woman, even though the Bible they rely on says it can be any number of things and in fact endorses polygamy, but no, oh, it's got to be one man and one woman, uh, and they claim this marriage is defined by natural moral law, and what's more, the Supreme Court doesn't have the authority to change that, yeah, yeah. This letter ends with a clear threat that conservatives will refuse to comply with any court ruling in support of marriage equality, although it's not exactly clear uh, what exactly it is that they would do, um, but uh, it doesn't change the fact that they made this threat. And one possibility, one possible outcome for them, and this could have actually have been part of the point of doing this letter, 
uh, is that it could lead to some TV appearances. A lot of the 200 signatories of this letter are long-standing anti-gay Christian activists who recently have fallen from favor. They've, they haven't been in the headlines recently. People haven't been paying attention to them. So maybe getting back on TV is part of their goal. Uh, all right, and in addition to that, there's actually one shot of related good news. I'm going to bring up a good a good news this week uh, related to this, um, and it because it shows you that sometimes, you know, not always, but sometimes people can surprise you. For nearly 40 years, there is this large Christian ministry called Exodus International. It's been claiming to uh, offer a cure for homosexuality. Well, on June 18th. Exodus released a statement apologizing to the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender community for years of harsh and hurtful judgments, both by the organization and by the Christian church in general. The next day, the group's board of directors announced the ministry is shutting down. Alan Chambers, president of Exodus, said, quoting, Exodus is an institution in the conservative Christian world, but we've ceased to be a living, breathing organism. For some time, we've been imprisoned in a worldview that's neither honoring toward our fellow human beings nor biblical. So it's good riddance to this outpost of pray away the gay bigotry. And for, to Alan Chambers, I have to say that um, I'm not one of the people against whom you were acting, so it's not for me to accept your apology. But uh, it does appear to be sincere, and so I hope the people to whom it's addressed can accept it. All right, we're going to move on from there. We're going to talk a lot, by the way, about the Supreme Court uh, today's episode. They seem to figure in, in about all of the items, one way or the other. But uh, this now, this is one of our regular weekly features. It's the Outrage of the Week. And how could this not be the outrage of the week? You know, usually when I do the outrage of the week, I, I like to talk about something that I think maybe hasn't gotten as much attention as it should that maybe you haven't heard about. But this, this has been all over the news, so I'm sure you've heard about it. But it is so morally outrageous and ethnic, ethically repugnant that I couldn't not discuss it. On Wednesday, June 25th, a day that will live in its own sort of infamy, the Supreme Court announced its decision in the case of Shelby County v. Holder, and in doing so, effectively gutted enforcement of central provisions of the Voting Rights Act. It did so on the entirely spurious grounds that, quoting, things have changed dramatically since the act was first passed in 1965. In other words, the Supreme Court, or more precisely, the reactionary majority making up the by now traditional five to four majority, that majority has decided that when it comes to voting, racism, racial discrimination just isn't a problem anymore. It's no, no problem. All done. All taken care of. At issue here were sections four and five of the Voting Rights Act. Now, section five is the part of the law that uh, enables the federal government to require areas with a history of racial discrimination to pre-clear any changes in their voting laws, getting approval either from the Department of Justice or from a special federal appeals court. Section 4 contains the formula for deciding who Section 5 applies to. Well, the Supreme Court, the um, uh, oh, I should say, by the way, that most, but not all, of those jurisdictions as defined in Section 4 uh, are in the South. Not all of them are. There are actually nine whole states, but one of them was Alaska. And there were also areas of California, South Dakota, Michigan, and New York also included in this. Well, the, uh, the troglodyte majority on the court let Section 5 stand, but said that Section 4 is obsolete and therefore unconstitutional. In other words, the Supreme Court said that the federal government can require areas with, with a history of racial segregation to pre-clear their changes to their voting, right, voting laws, but denied the government any means of determining what areas actually have that history. They left the law, but stripped away any means of enforcing it. This is insane. In the words of civil rights leader and, and longtime, uh, longtime member of Congress, uh, John Lewis, the court has put a dagger in the heart of the Voting Rights Act. 
The opinion here was written by Chief Justice John Roberts, whose picture is used to illustrate the word smug in the dictionary. He wrote, quoting, our country has changed, and while any racial discrimination in voting is too much, Congress must ensure that the legislation that passes to remedy that situation speaks to current conditions. There is no doubt that these improvements are in large part because of the Voting Rights Act. The Act has proved immensely successful at redressing racial discrimination and integrating the voting process. Now, in, so in reaching that conclusion, that is that racial discrimination has been redressed, dealt with, the majority looked at only two things, the rate of voter registration and the rates of voter turnout. The majority quite literally ignored the racial, ethnic, and class impacts of modern voter suppression techniques, such as voter ID laws, racial gerrymandering, cutting voting hours, and so on. Now, when Congress renewed the Voting Rights Act in 2006, it did so by overwhelming bipartisan majorities. It was like 390 to 30 something in the House, 98 to nothing in the Senate, and George Bush signed it. At that time, Congress produced what was called a mountain of evidence uh, showing the continuing need for the act and for the continuing formula in Section 4. In fact, writing for the, for the minority in this case, the dissenters in this case, uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg wrote that, quote, the record for the 2006 reauthorization makes abundantly clear that second generation barriers to minority voting rights have emerged in the covered jurisdictions as attempted substitutes for the first generation barriers that originally triggered preclearance in those jurisdictions. In other words, what she's saying is that the barriers to voting are now different than they were, but the same places are erecting them. None of that evidence, none of the congressional evidence appeared in the majority's decision. They didn't even address it, not even to reject it. So let's go back to Robert's statement. Let's go back to the one who said that the very improvements uh, that the majority claims render the formula used in Section 4 obsolete and so on un unconstitutional that the very, those very changes are largely due, he said, to the Voting Rights Act. Now think about that. The majority here is arguing that the very improvements that make the law obsolete are due to the law. This is exactly, this is precisely like saying, since we put a traffic light in at that intersection, there have been fewer traffic uh, car crashes there. So now because there have been fewer car crashes there, that proves we don't need the light. Or maybe you prefer Ginsburg's version. She referred to it as throwing away your umbrella in the middle of a rainstorm because you haven't been getting wet. This decision is inane. It is twisted. It ignores, it deliberately ignores, and I say deliberately because it had to be. It's too obvious for it to be done accidentally. It deliberately ignores the reality on the ground in the United States. It ignores even how the act is still being, or at least was, being used to combat discrimination in voting. In 2011, Florida attempted to cut early voting hours and an objection by the Department of Justice under Section 5 uh, forced Florida into a compromise on this. That compromise was so bad enough that during the 2012 elections, Florida and long lines became synonymous, but at least it was something. Just last summer, just last August, a redistricting plan in Texas was shot down under Section 5 after a federal court found that, quoting, the plan was enacted with discriminatory intent. It was designed to protect white incumbents and target minority incumbents. The court said that there was, quoting the court, more evidence of discriminatory intent than we have space or need to address. Later that same week, Texas was also blocked under Section 5 from instituting a voter ID law that was found by a federal court to, quote, impose strict, unforgiving burdens on the poor, and racial minorities in Texas are disproportionately likely to live in poverty. This was so bad that Texas's own data that they provided to the court said that this photo ID law would have a discriminatory impact against Hispanics. Earlier this year, 
the Department of Justice forced South Carolina to accept a broad interpretation. South Carolina has a new voter ID law, but it has a provision that you don't need the ID if you can give a reason for not having one. The federal government has forced, under Section 5, South Carolina to agree to a very broad interpretation of that exception. A photo voter ID law has been on hold in North Carolina for fear it would run afoul of Section 5. That law, now it's going to proceed. There's nothing to stop it. There is another law in Mississippi for the same thing. You know, and those, those last two, about those laws proceeding, those are not the only immediate impacts of this decision, of this putrid decision. Texas Attorney General, uh, Attorney General Greg Abbott has already announced that the state's voter ID law, the one with strict unforgiving burdens on the poor that even the state's own data showed to be discriminatory, it's going into effect immediately, he said. And the redistricting maps, the one with the discriminatory intent, are going to follow soon behind. Now, the thing is, at this point, the bigots and the bozos of the right will tell you, oh, yeah, no, just calm down. Racial and ethnic discrimination in voting, it's still illegal. Don't get so emotional. Well, first, racism and bigotry are not things that I ever intend to get unemotional about. But more directly, yeah, sure, it's still illegal. It's still illegal. Sure it is. So after the discrimination, after you're prevented from voting, after you're subjected to eight or ten hour lines to vote, after Texas gerrymanders its minority officials out of office, after the damage isn't done, after your rights have been taken away, after all that, then you can start a years-long, expensive, uh, draining legal battle uh, and all, with all the burden of proof on you at that point, and all the time this battle is going on, your rights are still being taken away from you. That is the answer? Oh, but wait, 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 wait. No, no, no. There's another answer. There's another answer. The filthy five, the malevolent majority of the Supreme Court, also said that Congress could just come up with another formula for, for Article 4. Now, the fact that when Congress renewed the act in 2006, it found the old formula still valid, again, was not even addressed by the majority in this case. But beyond that, what do you think are the chances that any time in the foreseeable future, that any time in the next century, Congress is going to be able to, to, to agree on what areas of the country have a, have a history of racial discrimination sufficient to impose Section 5? And if you think, and if you think for just one second that that is possible, well... Do you think the Filthy Five don't know that? Do you think they don't know the impossibility of that? Do you think that they're unaware of the long-term effects of their ruling? That they're unaware of the flood, the potential flood of bigoted laws that, uh, to which they have opened the gates? That they are unaware of the stranglehold that they have put on means to enforce voting rights and to guarantee racial and ethnic justice in voting? Do you think for a minute they're unaware of that? Because if you do, you're a fool. As John Lewis said, they stuck a dagger in the heart of the Voting Rights Act. They knew exactly what they were doing. At some point, at some point, at some point, after more pain, after more discrimination, after more battles, after more denials of rights, after more years of struggle that should not have been necessary, at some point, if justice ever does arrive, this decision will be as embarrassing to us now as, as Plessy v. Ferguson and Dred Scott are now, it will become something we don't even like to talk about. This decision is, as I said at the top, morally outrageous, eth ethically repugnant. And the filthy five justices, the filthy five injustices who voted for it, John Roberts, Antonin Scalia, Samuel Alito, Clarence Thomas, and Anthony Kennedy, are despicable. Oh, and by the way, a footnote. Scalia, part of the filthy five who ignored congressional intent and congressional findings on the need to continue part four. Remember, he's the guy that condemned the rest of the court for ignoring congressional intent on the Defense of Marriage Act. I need a break. Now that... Uh, 
Welcome back. By the way, that Supreme Court decision I talked about uh, just before the break about the Voting Rights Act, it was not the only, well, I started to say lame brain decision made, but that, again, is wrong because these people know what they're doing. It was not the only destructive decision that the Filthy Five pushed through. The day before, on Monday, uh, they handed down two more corporate bootlicking decisions. These ones make it harder for employees to sue businesses for discrimination or retaliation. In the first case, the court said that in order to be considered a supervisor in discrimination lawsuits, the person involved, the, the supposed supervisor, must be able to hire and fire people. The result of this is that it essentially leaves employees with no recourse against the management that uh, fails to deal with harassment or discrimination engaged in by lower level managers. The court then, in the second case, decided to limit how juries can decide retaliation suits. The victims, they said, must improve the employers would not have taken action against them but for their intention to retaliate. Now that is another, as, as the example in the particular case at hand was, if you leave your job after complaining about harassment only to be denied a promised job at a new employer because your old employer blackballed you, you have to prove that the only reason your employer did that was to get back at you for making your complaints, that they would not have done it but for the uh, intent to retaliate. The desire to retaliate against you can't be part of the reason. It's got to be the driving force behind this retaliation, the driving force without which this never would have happened. Now, what do you think of the, are the chances of anybody actually being able to prove that somebody retaliated against you just because they wanted to retaliate against you and just to retaliate for no other reason at all? You know, the minority was disturbed enough by these cases that Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who wrote the dissent in, for the minority in both cases, took the unusual step of reading them aloud from the bench as Justice Sam Alito rolled his eyes and shook his head. Ginsburg slammed, quoting, the court's disregard for the realities of the workplace. And in another unusual step, she took the time to specifically and directly call on Congress to pass a law to overturn the decision. This is what, in fact, as example, the court did in the case of the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act, which reversed a Supreme Court decision which had the effect of limiting empl employees' ability to, uh, to sue for pay discrimination. And this, by the way, these are just two of a long list of pro-corporate decisions SCOTUS has handed down in this term. One may, way of measuring this pro-corporate tilt, although tilt hardly begins to describe it, but one way of measuring it is done by the Constitutional Accountability Center. What they do is they keep track of what cases the U.S. Chamber of Congress in which cases the U.S. Chamber of Commerce files an amicus, a friend of the court brief, and then sees how those turn out. The Chamber of Commerce was on the winning side in 14 of 17 cases this year. Like I said before, the Filthy Five know exactly what they're doing, and it is all about power to the powerful. All right, and since we're talking about the Supreme Court, I might as well make it a clean sweep here. This is our other regular weekly feature. This is the Clown Award. Uh, it's given, the Clown Award is given on a regular basis for acts of meritorious stupidity. And this week, the recipient of the Big Red Nose goes to that ever faithful source of, what? Clarence Thomas. The case here involves a somewhat technical legal point about the proper interpretation of a previous Supreme Court decision regarding affirmative action in college admissions. By a vote of 7 to 1 uh, in a decision announced on, on June 24th, the Supreme Court told an appeals court that it misinterpreted the justice's precedent while it reviewed the policies of the University of Texas, Austin. The majority reiterated that affirmative action is a constitutional means to further the compelling state interest in having a diverse student body, but it said the appeals court had not looked closely enough at the actual policy at hand. Now, the decision's a sad one because what it does is it emphasizes that these admission programs are supposed to be subjected to what's called strict scrutiny. Uh, 
Meaning, in essence, that to defend a program like that or to challenge, the school would have to be able to show that this is absolutely necessary in order to achieve a diverse student body, that there is no so-called race-neutral means of doing it, which is, I think, is a very high standard to meet. And in fact, it's just another cut in the death by a thousand cuts that's being, uh, that affirmative action is suffering. But all, right, but all right, what about Thomas? He's our clown. What about Thomas? You see, Clarence Thomas is against affirmative action altogether. He wrote his own concurring opinion saying what he said before. He'd not only do away with the school's admissions program, he'd do away with affirmative action altogether. All programs everywhere. This despite the fact that Thomas himself is an affirmative action baby. When he applied to Yale Law School, he asked the school to take his race into account in their decision. But that's not why he gets, gets the big red nose. Not quite. Not quite. No. He also said in his autobiography that when he graduated from Yale, he couldn't find a job. He went on job interview after job interview with one high-priced lawyer after another and got treated dismissively. They even, he wrote, unsubtly suggested that they doubted I was as smart as my grades indicated. And why, according to Clarence Thomas, did this happen? Why did he have this problem? Because Yale had an affirmative action program. That's why these high-priced lawyers wouldn't believe the evidence of his grades, because Yale had an affirmative action program. Now, frankly, I can think of a much more obvious reason why these high-priced lawyers, at a time coming less than 10 years after the passage of the Voting Rights Act, why these high-priced lawyers might thought that this black guy was not smart enough for their exalted company. But not Clarence Thomas. Oh, no, not him. It was all about affirmative action. Clarence Thomas, a man so stuck in his ideology that in the case at hand that I just talked about, he compared the University of Texas's admissions program to slaveholders and segregationists. A man so stuck in his ideology that he insisted there that getting into college via an affirmative action program is worse for the person involved than not getting into college at all is a man so stuck in his ideology that he was incapable of recognizing racism when it walked up and smacked him right in the face. Clarence Thomas is a clown. Now, there's other stuff I've got to tell you I didn't get to this week. Uh, Barack Obama on climate change. There's more stuff about spying, uh, and more stuff about intrusion into private, about government surveillance, not only of the public, but also of its own employees, and encouraging snitching among government employees. Um, I'm going to have to get to some of that next week because it is very important. But for right now, I'm going to wrap up with our weekly reminder. As of June 26th, at least 5,443 people have been killed by gunfire in the United States since Newtown. 57 of them in Massachusetts. You have the best week you can. We will see you next week.